giant thing didn't help because it lands right in the middle. This is like uh, they say to sailors, you can take one compass on a ship or three, but don't take two. Well, we got three compasses, we got three different answers. So, and then this this uh, purple dot I just put there is just, this just came on the scene uh, using a completely different technique. And nobody knows what's going on here. But the purple dot's still the cosmic microwave background. I don't think so. I think- Well, you label it or no? No. No, no. no. okay, that's just, uh, just, you know just a fluke, the line goes there. You reminded me, I have to put a little note there where that piece of data came from. Uh, yeah, uh, but this is not what I'm talking about tonight, but it's, it's a very interesting as the measurements get better and better, we discover, oh my God, there's a real problem. I can't remember what this. Hi guys. <laughs> John Miller. Hi, Ben. Hi, John. How, come we, how come we can't see your face, man? I don't know. I keep upgrading that. I just wanted to zoom. Sometimes it shows up, sometimes it doesn't. I, I don't get it. Yeah, well. So you have to push the camera button. Well, I don't want to do that. I, I, well, I was <laughs> an exercise today. Years, John tried to do this kind of Zoom stuff for years and, and had a, a laptop that did not have a camera. And we we had such fun teasing him about that. Uh, I'm going to switch my, uh, my uh, Zoom to, whoops. That to map, my, by the way, for everyone, is where I live, roughly. Oh, yeah. I was showing, uh, I was looking at a map. Um, my camera was removed from the Israelis so I could take my uh, laptop into the Israeli facilities. Oh, yeah, there's there. Harold right there. If you look close, you can see Harold right there. Right there. You can zoom right in. There he is. No, you just actually go move down a little bit. Yeah. You keep going. And North Main Street, keep going south a little bit. Let me just see if we're, yeah, and you're gonna keep going south a little more. Stop, see where Maple Avenue is? Uh, go go Maple, north a little bit on the map. Uh, I see route. Seven, yeah, go up route seven, a little further north out, off screen, there's Maple Avenue. Go east on Maple Avenue. Oh, uh, there it is, okay. Keep going east. Yeah, yeah. Keep going. It's going to change its name to county. Yeah, yeah. Go left at the fork. Take home road up the hill. Oh, my God. Turn right on crossroad. There's crossroad. Yeah, go down and about. So they're right near the, the cross that's uh, in the middle of the cro of crossroad. Uh, right here? No, no, just wait a second. I... I I can't do that. I can. Uh, so I thirty can years ago, this would be considered a miracle that we could do this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, somehow I can. But, here. But we do need to get started, guys. So, yeah. yeah. You can use around there. Now. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna, uh, Harold. We're gonna we're gonna give this up for. Okay. Give uh, up for science, so, but that's where I am. All right, everybody. So welcome to the science for the board. Tonight, uh, we were going to be uh, hearing about drug development, but we're not going to hear that. And uh, in fact, we're going to be hearing about solar neutrinos from Ed Friedman. And now, I, I, gotta, I need a little help, fellas, because I've lost the ability to share my screen. What are you seeing? Um, I'm seeing? I'm seeing your screen. You're seeing my That's science for the board, but, but you, what you need to do is you need to oh I see it and then, then I see it and, and then do it again. Yeah, I got it. There we go. I'm almost ready to launch this thing. Okay. Um, tee -tee -tee -tee. That's it. That's it. Yeah. There we go. All right. Okay, so a little background of why this makes mention of something called Azamara Quest. Uh, Fifteen months ago, thirteen months ago. Uh, I was invited to speak on a cruise ship owned by the Azamara Cruise Line because there was an eclipse 
in uh, the Arabian Sea, and they wanted somebody astronomical to talk about what we were watching. And so I got invited to attend with my wife, and we cruised from Dubai to Mumbai, India, and witnessed the eclipse. Actually, you'll see it here in a second. Um, so that's why it talks about the cruising and stuff. Uh, here's a model of the, uh, the sun and the meandering path that photons take. Uh, photons generated in the deep in the sun bounce around, scatter, and so forth. And a, and a couple hundred thousand years later, they pop out and become uh, part of the sunlight we experience or the whole solar system experiences. Uh, but right at in the deep in the center, the fusion, per, uh, the fusion process that produces light and heat um, produces neutrinos. Uh, particularly produces a version of neutrinos called an electron neutrino. And I'm going to tell you the story tonight of why this um, it led scientists on a, a, a path to uh, resolve a mystery. So here we go. Uh, neutrinos were predicted in 1930 to solve a problem related to uh, subatomic physics. And it took uh, another 26 years to actually detect neutrinos. Uh, they were the first detected in the vicinity of nuclear reactors. Uh, the sun produces a stupendous amount of neutrinos. There are some many billions passing through your every square centimeter of you every second. But nuclear reactors also produce these, these particles, which um, originally th were thought to be massless. We'll talk about that. So billions per second flowing through us and to understand what they are and why they're important, um, we have to understand a little bit about subatomic particles and the so-called particle zoo. So neutrons, protons, quarks, uh, there's a lot of different particles in the zoo. I'll show you the zoo in a second. And with only a few of these, here's the zoo, you only need a few of these to create the entire universe. The, the other ones, we don't know why, what their function is, but we have quarks. These guys up, charm top, down, strange, and bottom, and you can build nuclear particles like neutrons and protons out of like two ups and a down produces a neutron or two downs and an up produces a, a proton and so forth. Then you have these lighter particles called leptons, electron, and the big brother of the electron called the muon and a related family member called the tau. And we now know there are three kinds of neutrinos. That was not known originally. There was only a neutrino. And then there's some other particles here. These ones in orange are facilitators of force. For example, an electromagnetic force that sparks when you touch your dog's nose, that's facilitated by photons. And uh, the weak force is facilitated by the W boson. Anyway, th these guys make things happen in the force world. And then the Higgs boson exists. Uh, you, it conveys the concept of mass to all these particles. So anyway, this is the modern version of the standard model, the, the so-called uh, elementary particle zoo, keeping in mind that originally up until the mystery of solar neutrinos was solved, there was only one kind of neutrino understood. So um, Higgs boson was found in 2012, uh, actually was fortunate enough to be at CERN just weeks before they announced the, the discovery that was a Nobel Prize for Higgs. Um, neutrinos, that's what we're gonna talk about. So, in the 1930s, there was a lot of effort to understand the source of energy coming out of the sun. Uh, gradually, by the late 30s, they understood it was fusion of hydrogen into helium and the production of other elements in the sun. And the process involved neutrinos. They had to postulate the neutrino 
to guarantee that conservation of energy was preserved. And what was not known then, but is known now, is that different kinds of neutrinos are produced at different rates, depending on what, how, how you're producing heavy elements through fusion in the sun. Yeah. And it turns, yes, sir. Wasn't it, it was the, uh, wasn't it the conservation of the lepton number? Well, that was another factor, but the original concept of uh, Enrico, oh, Enrico Fermi was, we don't have conservation of energy in when we see uh, an electron spontaneously jump out of a nucleus. You see an electron pop out, but there, there was concern about a violation of the conservation of energy and momentum. And Fermi said, there must be a little thing, a little neutral particle that is, we don't see it, but it's, it's how the system is balanced in energy. And he called it a neutron. But already the, the, the neutron we all know and love that's in the nucleus had already been found. So he had to change his name, the name to a tiny neutron and in Italian, that turns into neutrino. Um, so what we have is when you fuse protons to produce helium, you get a couple of positrons. These E pluses are the positively charged electron, but you also get a neutrinos. And so there's actually three ways this process flows. The most common one is fusion of, of helium-3 into helium four and a couple of hydrogens and a neutrino. But there's a second branch that's more complicated that involves production of beryllium and the beryllium captures an electron, you get lithium and the lithium captures a hydrogen and you get helium. But along the way, you get this neutrino. And, there's, and that's only, that only happens 15% of the time. And branch three involves two heliums, one standard and one depleted with, uh, from, with a neutron missing, and you get beryllium, blah, 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 same kind of idea. And then boron is a, a participant, boron being atomic number eight. And boron uh, begets beryllium, a positron, and yet another kind, oh, and gets a neutrino. All these neutrinos that are produced, this one, this one, and this one, are all electron neutrinos. So uh, the original theory thought that only electron neutrinos would be produced. There are two other kinds. Remember, let's go back to the, the, the particle zoo. The three kinds are the electron neutrino. Then there's a neutrino associated with the heavy cousin of the electron, so-called muon neutrino. And then there's yet a, another, not quite as heavy, oh, actually much bigger, the tau, he has his own neutrino. So this was a great achievement, understanding production of energy in, by fusion in the sun. And this is Hans Bethe, who the story goes, he went to a conference in 1938 and sat there for a day listening to people explain their theories of how the sun produces energy and uh, went back to his hotel room. It was some conference. He went back to the hotel room and spent the night and part of the next morning and redid everything and got worked the whole thing out in one evening, essentially, and went back and said, okay, I watched you guys. Uh, you missed a bunch of stuff, but I know I now understand it. And he showed the first complete model of energy production in the sun, including the production of neutrinos and uh, that resulted in a Nobel Prize. Um, his model involved hydrogen fusing. You get uh, deuterium, helium-3. These kind of, uh, so-called nuclear chemistry going on deep in the sun. And eventually, you get helium-4. And in the process, neutrinos, there's a neutrino coming out there. There's a neutrino coming out there, gamma rays or, or photons and so forth. So it's a very complex thing. But here's the problem with neutrinos. If you want to confirm that your theory is correct, you, you should probably go try to find them. 
And a neutrino just doesn't interact with matter much at all. Here's a, here's a typical way to describe how interactive they are. If you take a block of lead that's 100 light years thick, on average, a neutrino traveling through 100 light years of lead will, on the average, interact one time. So th these things just are now. On the other hand, there, as I said, there are billions and billions of them flowing out of the sun. And so we can overcome this, this extremely low probability for detecting the presence of a neutrino uh, because we have so many of them to work with. So in 1967, Raymond Davis went to South Dakota and he arranged to work in an abandoned mine called Homestake a mile underground, and we want to be underground to do this because we want to suppress the number of neutrinos that are produced high in the atmosphere by cosmic rays. Uh, a galactic cosmic rays can produce showers of uh, large numbers of neutrinos, so some of that can be managed by going underground, as we shall see. And that's a good thing. So the ex early experiments were done, and they saw neutrinos, and this is the way you see them, is you have a darkened chamber with very sensitive uh, photo detectors. And when a neutrino happens to interact, it produces a shower of particles, some of which produce visible light. And by analyzing that light, you could say, ah, a neutrino generated that light. And uh, so uh, Davis's team found neutrinos, but they found only a third of the number they expected. And they, they had Hans Bethe's theory to work with and Bethe's theory predicted how many neutrinos should be detected at Earth. And so the question is, what's wrong? Experiment our theory. Of course, everybody was thrilled that the uh, results did not agree with theory because that meant there's more to learn. So, uh, they began to think about what, what is causing this problem. Now, the Homestake experiment, I'll show you in a second, has a tank of carbon tetrachloride, and it produces isotopes in radioactive argon. That's actually how the detection occurs, that the neutrino cl crashing into chlorine atom will produce radioactive argon, and then when that decays, it has a unique signature. So we have it underground. Here's a picture of it, a mile underground, just a huge tank filled with carbon tetrachloride and photodetectors. We'll talk about cosmic rays later. The problem is the neutrino production rate for this, for the type of neutrinos that this is sensitive to, is related to the method of production let me go back and show you. Remember, I showed you three ways that fusion occurs Whoop. right here, this one. It's the least likely way to produce that electron neutrino. So the number of neutrinos generated in a way that's detectable using carbon tetrachloride is small. And the lowest rates occurred. So the, the Homestake experiment lasted for 30 years. And during that time, they detected 2,000 neutrinos, which is a hard way to make a living. That's a few detections per month, uh, 100,000 gallons of, of fluid, by the way. And uh, so the, the original, the theory said they should see eight detections a month of, from that particular fusion process in the sun and they only found on the average about one to three. So they were finding a third of the neutrinos they should have found and nobody knew what to do about this. So the th Beta's theory is sensitive to what's going on deep in the sun. You have to know things like temperature and pressure. And of course we can't go there and do anything uh, about that. We can't make measurements. Um, and so there was question about what was going on, but people realized that in the 50s, mid 50s, an Italian physicist had thought that maybe neutrinos 
would migrate from one form to another over time. And this migration is periodic. And so this is called neutrino oscillations. Now this theory had, now remember we're now in the, in the 1960s. So this theory was 10 years old. It had been pretty much set aside. Nobody took it very seriously. And we, uh, in my talk, I call this the uh, cuckoo idea. They, they, nobody really understood how a neutrino, remember we still only have one kind of neutrino uh, being described in the physics world. How could one kind of neutrino oscillate to other kinds? And this seemed cuckoo. Uh, but um, so uh, other efforts were started to try to figure out what's the problem. So they. They created an international team of independent groups to redo Hans Bethe's calculations from the late 30s. And by now we had computers and new understanding of, uh, of nuclear physics. And these teams went working independently and collaborated. Meanwhile, Davis and his team kept working on their experiment to try to solve the problem and make it more sensitive. And the Russians, among others, got involved. They thought, hey, there's another way to sense these neutrinos. Instead of using carbon tetrachloride, the material gallium can be a good place to stop a neutrino and see a unique um, uh, signature. So they scoured around and they basically gathered up all the gallium that was available and built a new neutrino detector based on gallium. So I've already said some of this. Okay. By 1988, people found the muon neutrino. So we're now, remember we, the, the theory got mature in 39. So we're now 50 years into this process. Uh, in, the, in the early 80s, the muon neutrino was found. That's a Let new. Me just say, that's when the prize was awarded to Letterman and Company. They right. found it in 62. They right. found it a lot earlier. Yeah. So uh, the, the muon neutrino was found and a Nobel Prize in 88 for finding it. Moreover, people started realizing that these neutrinos each has an antiparticle that helped understand the theory. And uh, that first neutrino I mentioned was detected in 56, so that um, uh, took 40 years to win a Nobel Prize. Um, so now, because we're beginning to understand there's a family of neutrinos, the electron neutrino, and it has an antiparticle, electron neutrino antiparticle, the muon neutrino and its anti, and the tau neutrino in, it, in its anti. And so the mist, but the mystery continued. Um, the gallium sensors worked and they had an advantage. They could sense the direction from which a neutrinos were arriving. So the, the home stake thing would just light up when a neutrino collided with something in the tank, but you couldn't tell from whence that neutrino came. The gallium sensors produced essentially a track and you could see the trajectory from which the neutrino arrived. And that turns out to be important. And the Japanese also are working on this. They had the idea they were going to detect decay of protons. So they built an underground facility called Kamio Kandi and then upgraded it to what is now called Super K, Super Kamio Kandi. And they also, it turned out, they could also detect neutrinos. So originally they were just looking at decay of protons, but they it turned out they could also see and distinguish um, different kinds of neutrinos and from the, and determine the direction from which they arrived. And so uh, here's a picture of my friend, Neil Tyson floating in the Cameo Kandi in a rubber boat. Um, all these things that look like light bulbs are not. These are photo detectors. So when this thing is in operation, it's totally dark, uh, filled with very highly purified water. And then these photo detectors are waiting for something to happen. Here's a bigger picture of that. So 
as I said, Cameo Condi was designed to detect proton decay. It was modified. So it could see the decay of boron isotopes, which are important in detecting certain kinds of these neutrinos. But then something fortuitous happened. In 1987, there was a supernova right in our neighborhood. Uh, 1987A, it was visible to the naked eye. It was really bright. Uh, only 170,000 light years from Earth. And within a few weeks after the visible light was detected from this explosion, uh, we started seeing a, a flood of neutrinos. And Cameo Condi and the gallium sensors were able to confirm that they actually detected the direction from which the neutrinos were coming because optical telescopes had located, it was not hard to locate this, this supernova, you could see it with the naked eye. So the telescopes knew where the source was on the sky and the super K and the gallium sensors confirmed they could tell that same thing, they could localize the source. And that turns out to be very important. So Super K was converted and managed to do repeat Davis's results. And they were much more efficient. Um, and I, I have, a, by the way, here is the a, a little film loop of 1987A for over uh, 20 years, this goes up to, 2007, I think, yeah. And so you can go look this up now. It looks like a ring nebula. It's, it's had the explosion that blew everything away and it's very interesting. So um, now there's more to this. Remember I said Hans Bethe's theory uh, has to depend on the pressure and density in, deep in the sun where we cannot visit. But over this, period, the astronomical technique of helioseismology had evolved and become fairly mature. And helioseismology can compare a model of the dynamics of a star, particularly the sun, with what is observed by looking at the surface oscillations. I have an animation here of how the vibration modes of the sun vary and th this, these vibration modes depend on the pressure and density and temperature deep in the sun. So by picking the right values for temperature, density and sound velocity in, deep in the sun until they match these modal oscillations of the sun, you could, you could look at or, or calculate what's going on in the center of the sun. And it turned out that the numbers that had been used in Hans Bethe's theory were very good. You see the accuracy that was achieved, but instead of guessing at those numbers or trying to calculate them, you could actually confirm that by looking at the vibrational modes of the sun. So that told us that Hans Bethe's theory for light production in the sun or fusion in the sun was correct because it produced very highly accurate estimates of these parameters, temperature, density, and so forth. So what else is going on? So turns out muon neutrinos are produced by cosmic rays striking the upper atmosphere, not just uh, production in the sun, kind of like this. A cosmic ray comes in, these are very energetic particles, much more energetic than uh, the energies that can be achieved at the accelerators like CERN, where they collide protons. These, these uh, cosmic rays are extremely powerful. And so you get a shower constantly being showered with neutrinos. And the question is, can we use those neutrinos, that is the muon neutrino from cosmic rays and the electron neutrinos from the sun, could we somehow put those together and combine them using the cuckoo idea that neutrinos change from one type 
to another uh, over time. And because super K can tell the direction from which neutrinos come, a, an experiment was conceived to figure this out this way. So we have uh, cosmic rays coming into the atmosphere from all directions. Here's Japan, and there's the super K is in Japan. So any uh, neutrinos that were created in the atmosphere above super K would be seen at super K. And because super K can tell what direction things are coming from, uh, you can tell which neutrino events are coming from the atmosphere above super K. At the same time, you could tell that there are other neutrinos coming to super K from this side of Earth, because once again, super K can tell which direction these things are coming from. And there's muon neutrinos being produced over here as well. And Earth, as I said, neutrinos do not interact with matter much at all. So at super K, you have two sources of neutrinos, some coming from the atmosphere above the facility and some coming from the atmosphere on the other side, propagating through the planet. And this is the result they got. The red curve shows what to expect if neutrinos are stable on the scale of the size of Earth. The green curve shows what data you should expect if neutrinos are changing from one type to another, namely from electron neutrinos to muon neutrinos while they travel. And this end of the curve is the result of, of neutrinos propagating through the planet. And this side of the curve has to do with neutrinos produced in the atmosphere above super K. And the, the dots show you what was measured. So this is the first evidence that neutrinos are changing from one type to another. And this was done at super K. I've said all this before. Meanwhile, people weren't done. So uh, in Sudbury, Canada, they went two kilometers underground, you know, a mile and a half and built another facility. And you can see the scale of it, there's a, a cartoon character right there. This doesn't use carbon tetrachloride, it uses heavy water, such as was widely used in producing uh, uranium for atomic bombs. And it confirmed Davis's results, except it was much more efficient. Remember, Davis made 3,000 detections, uh, 2,000 detections in 30 years. This system using heavy water made 3000 detections in six months. So the body of information available was dramatically increased. Plus, oh, let's go back. Plus this technique can detect all kinds of neutrinos, muon, tau, and electron neutrinos. So ultimately, here's the comparison that was published in 2013 after a lot of data analysis that the measurements made at Sudbury came in at 5.25, and you don't have to worry about the units. This is a appropriate number for electron plus muon plus tau neutrinos. That is, this machine was detecting all kinds of neutrinos. Here's the theoretical prediction, 5.58. So you see it's different, but not by much. So what really happened is it took decades to do this, has confirmed that, that um, there's three kinds of solar neutrinos. A few of the people who were instrumental in doing this work did not uh, survive to win their prize because you have to be alive to win your prize. So 88, this is the group that um, used the muon neutrino, found and used the muon neutrino to do some other work. Uh, Davis and the head of uh, Super K won in 2002 for their understanding of cosmic neutrinos and the production of neutrinos in the atmosphere. And then these two guys won for Sudbury in 2015. 
Now, let's look at the modeling results. And if you go online, you can find a model. Oh, gosh, an hour flew. Oh, no, we've only done a half an hour. OK. Um, so there's, there are models you can play with. I have some example results here. Um, and here's what goes on. This, this uh, depiction goes from the center of the sun 30,000 kilometers. So it, it's still showing you what's going on inside the sun. And inside the sun, almost all the production of neutrinos is related to the electron neutrino. As I said earlier, the process that's most common in fusion in the sun dominantly produces electron neutrinos. But there's a small number of tau and muons. And these neutrinos, as they're propagating, depends on their energy, but as they propagate through the sun on their way out, which only takes a tiny amount of time, they you see this oscillation. This is the oscillation that was predicted in 1957. And if you compare that or add it to the oscillations of the muon to, uh, of neutrino and the tau neutrino, Every place along the curve, the sum of these is equal to one. That is, any electron neutrino that converts to a mu uh, depletes this line, but contributes to muons and taus. And this is the way the curve propagates. Sorry. Question, why is the oscillation? Uh, these, these guys have, uh, they're, they're essentially quantum mechanically unstable. They, they insist on migrating from one state to another. Uh, I, I, I should have a good analogy for this. Um, and I don't, I'll, I'll keep thinking about this while we're talking, but they just, they are not stable. They just can continue to deplete the, the electron neutrinos and increase the population of mu's and tau neutrinos. And they just keep doing that. And uh, here's a slightly different energetic level. And you see the this is the same dimensionality that is from the center of the sun out about 30,000 kilometers. You're still inside the sun. But if, we, if you change a couple of key parameters, one of them is called the coupling constant, you see this is a different evolution for the neutrinos. Depends on their energy level too. That's how big Earth is on this scale. Um, but the total amount of neutrinos in all these curves is equal to 100%. No, no neutrinos are lost. So, and the different neutrinos, it turns out, they travel at different speeds. And this was something that was discovered by studying solar neutrinos. That immediately implies that they have mass. The, if they were massless particles, which was the original assumption by Enrico Fermi in the 1930s, that these are massless particles. We now know, because these guys travel at different speeds, that they have mass. The mass is exceedingly small, but it is not zero. It cannot be zero. And so here's a, another uh, application of the model where we've now stretched out the scale out to somewhere here. Uh, this is at Earth. And you can see electron neutrinos, they don't just go down. It goes up and down. So there's actually multiple oscillations. There's a sine wave here, right? The blue curve is up and down. But imposed on it is another sine wave that oscillates up and down. And any time an electron neutrino decides to switch to a mu or a tau, this curve drops and the muon tau curves go up, but always the total is 100%. And if you zoom in on this little section here, so I've taken a little slice here, over this interval of distance, the neutrinos, the number oscillates, but not very much and they generally keep their original flavor. So this electron, the, the electron neutrinos gradually, and as we propagate to the right, you deplete the muon neutrinos a little bit and the electron neutrino level goes up. So the idea is if you put a sensor right here, you would measure, it'd be like drawing a line here. You would measure this value for electron, this one for mu and this one for tau. 
And you can experiment around with these things and change the, the uh, coupling constants, the mass parameters and so forth. And uh, so there's a model. Uh, I have a link if you want to do that. It's kind of amusing to play with it for 30 seconds or so. Now, we're not done with this because in Switzerland at CERN, the big accelerator near Geneva, when they run their particle accelerator and crash protons into each other, they, without making any effort, they are producing a beam of neutrinos that heads in the direction of Italy. And so uh, the, here's uh, CERN located uh, right outside of Geneva, interesting place to visit. Uh, this is the big ring where they collide protons and the neutrino flow is this red arrow. It goes southeast and it goes, also it goes down. So here's, here's the cutaway of the area. Well, here's the airport at, New, at Geneva and the beam goes downhill like that. And downhill means it goes in this direction and there's Italy. And so there's a, whenever they run the beam, they get a flood of neutrinos at the research facility in a place called Grand Sasso. So uh, a top view looks like this. So here's Geneva, the CERN facilities here, Grand Sasso is there, and the beam comes up to the surface. You know, see it descends and then it, it encounters the surface here at Grand Sasso. So they have a big facility there. And along the way, Oh, oh, and the, the accelerator at CERN produces muon neutrinos. But as they're traveling through the planet, and just because they're aging, they turn into tau neutrinos, like this. So they originally, they start with almost all uh, muons, abbreviated this way. But gradually, the taus come up, and the muons go down, and so it oscillates again. Uh, no electron neutrinos are produced in this process. Uh, meanwhile, Grand Sasso also sees the showers of muon neutrinos coming from cosmic rays. Uh, the Germans are building a facility. By now, it's probably online. It's called Katrin. And this, is, uh, this uses uh, uh, tritium, radioactive gas to do the detections. And they hope that by using this technique, they will find the mass of the neutrinos. And uh, here's the container moving through the little village in Karlsruhe on uh, some big, big trucks. You can see people here wondering what in the Dickens they're doing with this. And so uh, I have to check and see if that facility is Going. Now, there was fun about the, the uh, facility at Grand Sasso because um, the Minister of, of Scientific Research in Italy about 10 years ago announced that the, her country had funded the tunnel between CERN and Geneva and Grand Sasso, uh, that they had spent millions and millions of euros to dig the tunnel so that the beam, whoop, so that, that that is a tunnel from here to here. And uh, of course, there's no tunnel needed because the neutrinos do not even notice Earth. They fly right through. But this poor lady said, oh, that we dug a tunnel and we need some credit for digging that tunnel, uh, which, by the way, would be 900 kilometers long. Um, and the press challenged her and said, lady, that's not right. And she doubled down. She stuck with her story, which was too bad. But, you know, some, she misunderstood what she was told and it just was embarrassing. So uh, that's all I'm gonna say about neutrino. I have a couple cartoons. Yeah, guy lost his uh, electron and are you sure? Yeah, I'm positive. And these are the different kinds of uh, Particles in atoms, you got the positive proton, the neutral neutron, and the very negative electron. Uh, so, uh, oh, and yeah, these are pictures. This is a picture of Grand Sasso, which is uh, doing some 
cutting edge research on uh, atmospheric neutrinos and neutrinos coming from CERN. So that's the story of my version of the story of solar neutrinos. I'm sure there's some people on here who can contribute because uh, they're they're actual professional physicists on the call. And uh, I can I might say one thing, if it would amuse you about the uh, region that there had to be a neutrino. Back in the 30s, we knew about beta decay. You knew if you had a nucleus like we had a neutron in it, it could decay into a proton and an electron. So a neutron goes to a proton and an electron. That's only two coming out. They balance to go in opposite direction with equal momentum to conserve momentum. So they have a fixed energy. All you have to know is the difference between the masses of the two and the mass of the neutron. You get a single energy, and yet they saw a spectrum of energies coming out. They saw a whole spectrum. That meant there had to be three body decay, not two body. So there had to be a, a little thing you couldn't see, wouldn't interact with anything, but it had to be there. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And uh, uh, that was a shock. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I'm right now, I'm reading a, um, biogra a biography of Niels Bohr, who is right in the middle of all this, trying to figure out how is it possible that we are seeing electrons fly out of a nucleus, and uh, it seems to violate uh, conservation of energy and all all other kind of problems. And uh, it took a couple of years before somebody uh, probably got a little bit drunk and said, "I'm going to think of some way this can happen. It must involve." a particle we don't see, we can't detect. And it took 50 years for the first detections. Well, so it's a great story. And uh, uh, Hans Bethe, uh, Hans Bethe's theory of uh, power production in the sun was uh, confirmed. And at just the right time, 1938 or 1939, right before World War II, people who went to Man the Manhattan Project could be confident that we had an incomplete understanding of nuclear physics, but what we knew was right. And that contributed enormously to how they proceeded to design uh, bombs. So. Ed? Yes. Yeah, I, I'm assuming that the, the statement there were three types of neutrinos early on, that was just the symmetry argument, the symmetry group from no, no, or what? No, what was that? Well, as I mentioned, the only the original theory that Beta had only had one kind of neutrino. Yeah, and then it went to three. Yeah, it was. It took well. It took uh, thirty years for that to happen. The first yeah. one was in thirty-one. The next one was in sixty-two, and the next one, the last one, was in seventy-eight. Something like that. Right. It took a while. Prediction, say symmetry group prediction, or um, you you did expect three families. Right. Like symmetry had to do with the expectation, but I guess you're right. We we were looking for another lepton, and it was called the tau. It was found in '77. I think they were expecting that because of symmetry arguments. Finally found it in California, and then a little later they found the tau neutrino. Right. Once you once you found the, the heavy version of the electron, you and you already knew about the muon neutrino, you could say with confidence there's going to be a tau neutrino. We just have to figure out how to detect it. And the the problem is, you know, these these various detectors I described, it takes years to design and build them. And they uh, you're it's like building the gravity wave, a gravitational wave sensor. I've heard Kip Thorne talking about this. Uh, people challenged him constantly about, well, we're going to spend billions of dollars to build this uh, gravitational wave sensor. Do we know there's anything out there to detect? And he was very confident that mergers of large, massive bodies in the universe were occurring all the time. And there would be gravitational waves to, in a spectral range that the the gravitational wave sensor could detect. Uh, so, yeah, you're rolling the dice, uh, hoping that you're, you're the properties of the thing you're looking for, namely the tau neutrino, for example, that the sensor you're about to build in Canada or Japan or wherever 
that you can detect that thing. And they, people understand this standard model that I have on the screen right now is enormously successful. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just probably the most mature uh, scientific theory ever invented. Uh, Murray Gelman used it to discover, well, let me, I probably need some help on this. The W boson was the... the, the he, he, Murray goes back to quarks. In the early right. 60s, he predicted quarks. But he, if you build a map of the particles you should expect to see, the sigmas and all the other things, there was an empty spot in the, in the yeah, family there was, tree. There were, there were three, three strange particles, uh, three strange quarks. Gave the omega minus. Oh, right. The omega minus. Thank you. Was that, yeah. the, that was the, the eightfold way, the, the symmetry from the SU3 representation, I think. Right. right. Yes, sir. You're yeah. saying it right. Right. You uh, said that. So the predictions, wherever you see these gaps, uh, people are successful in doing predictions. Now, what's not on the standard model, and the, the people at CERN are looking for all the time, is the super symmetric counterparts to all this. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, for example, we have miss also missing here is the graviton, which is yeah. thought to be the conveyor of the gravitational force. If you, and, but all, if there are super symmetric particles, you would add Eno to all these, these names. You'd have the electron Eno, the gravitino and so forth. Uh, Progress is slow in finding the supersymmetric partners of all these things. Well, they're they're too they're too massive, I think, right? I mean, they yeah. It's like they, trying to find. Uh, uh, this is the problem with trying to do research on strings. I could talk about string theory sometime, <laughs> uh, because the the energies required to detect uh, strings, which are thought to be by some people thought to be the foundational structure of the universe, you need enormous energies. Uh, I, I see estimates that, well, you need an accelerator, take CERN and make it bigger to, so that it's on the same scale as the orbit of, of Uranus, or sometimes they say the size of the galaxy. Uh, we don't know how to do that. So. Well, okay. Or figure out how to do it with cosmic ray physics. because Well, that's crazy. exactly, exactly yeah. right. Oh, and cosmic good. rays have such stupendously high energies that you could possibly do something that way. So this, this whole story that I've been talking about is an enormous success in understanding solar physics, nuclear physics in general. You, you mentioned the uh, graviton, and my impression has been that that's still theory. Is that that's right? And I wondered if any progress is being made since I studied all this about the graviton. Well, here's what we know, Judy, that the, uh, one of the big successes, perhaps a success of string theory is that it automatically produces the, or predicts the existence of a particle with what is called spin two. Right. And the graviton is thought to have spin two. So advocates for string theory will say we're on the right track because the, the theory automatically predicts a, uh, a quantum mechanical particle that has the right properties to explain uh, the gravitational field. There are lots of other limitations to, to this, uh, to string theory. It, it goes up and down in popularity. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, it has its advocates. Brian Green, who's written a lot of popular books, uh, yeah. is a string theory advocate. Uh, yes. He's written some books. I actually have one of his books. Yeah, he, if you're interested he in string very well. So it's yeah, yeah, very entertaining. And you can find him on. Uh, public television occasionally doing things. He does YouTube. He's on YouTube a lot. Right. Another him. advocate is Michio Kaku. Yep. It's one of the uh, founder. It, it seems like the center of the world of strings is New York City. Yeah, it's in Kaku. Columbia, they call themselves. Yeah, right. So Kaku is a big advocate. Uh, out on the West Coast, Leonard Susskind, one of the founders of string theory. 
Uh, I would just like to make a, a comment. I, I know Brian well, and him and I were having dinner a few years ago, and I pointed out to him that a hundred years ago, when Neil Bohr was coming up with the atom theory, everybody said that was philosophy and not science, because we could never see an atom. We could never like uh, a, a experiment with an atom. And now here in Portland, there's a company that makes a microscope that pushes atoms around. So, you know, I, I hear you that the, we might need a, a cyclotron as big as Saturn or Uranus, but let's give you, Mandy, one or 200 years and then and, and see what they can do. Yep, yep, I agree. Um, well, yeah, I mean, Einstein's theory of gravity, 100 years old now, uh, he talked about, frequently talked about the fact that not, uh, this is just an intellectual exercise. We're not going to do anything with this. And uh, we all now have a, a little piece of uh, general relativity in our pocket because we all carry around GPS, which does not work unless you do clock corrections for the, uh, uh, for the difference in clock rates on Earth and in, in the satellites. Uh, and a lot of that pioneering work was done at the University of Maryland. And uh, uh, so where I went to school and Joe Weber was there trying to do it. Weber was there and uh, yeah. So the point is a hundred years, uh, we went from just a speculation and uh, un nice to understand how the universe is structured, but then we have a practical application which is valuable to uh, in a lot of industries. So uh, yeah, we're not, uh, uh, not uh, gonna shut anything down. Although I will take some money to build an accelerator the size of the orbit of Uranus. Let me just mention that supersymmetry is really just a theory. It hadn't really been, we're not persuaded it has to be true. So we shouldn't kill ourselves trying to find a Susie particle. Try reasonably yeah. hard, but don't go crazy. And string theory is the same. It has no predictions that can be tested as I understand. So keep that in mind. A question, if I may, uh, does the, the discrepancy in the, so the uh, Hubble constant, this, uh, I, I gather that the uh, cosmic microwave background calculation is sort of, <clears throat> and I, I have not worked through the math on this, so maybe I'm totally wrong, but I think thought that was based on the standard model. And, and, and thus, there's, this leads to some questions to whether there's some new physics required. I'm just wondering. Oh, uh, you're talking about uh, getting the Hubble constant from the cosmic microwave background? Yeah, that, 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 that basically, how do I resolve the fact that, that, that the two numbers are different? And what does that tell me about the, the physics well, yeah. I learned, yeah, I mentioned to the group uh, something we were, you and I were talking about before we started, and that is um, Sean Carroll has a, a podcast where he interviews scientists and recently interviewed Adam Rice, who won the Nobel Prize for, along with two others, for detecting the accelerating expansion of the universe. And Adam Rice's whole career now is wrapped up in trying to figure out why uh, we can't agree on what the Hubble constant is. And it is possible that, that we, we are missing something about our assumptions about the, the cooling of the universe, which uh, has occurred as the universe has gotten bigger, the temperatures dropped and so forth. Um, and can, can you un, un, unshare uh, so we can see people? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, so Adam Rice, who uh, you know he has a he has a, a Nobel Prize in his pocket, but uh, he's he's worried about why can't we agree on uh, how to calculate the expansion rate of the universe? And it's not just a little bit; it's like a ten percent difference. Oh yeah, it's huge now. Yeah, and, you and understand? Other... Can you simply explain in a few words how the CMB? Tells you the Hubble constant. Uh, yeah. So the CMB, Chris, is a picture of the radiation pattern across the sky roughly 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And there's presumption about 
how the universe evolved from that state. Uh, there's, a, there's a period of, well, actually, while we're talking, I'll bring up a, ch a chart. There's a period uh, during which the, the universe is dark and uh, completely dark because there were atoms in the universe, but there were, there were no stars. So in that interval, the universe is completely dark and bear with me, I'm trying to do two things at once. I'm gonna show you something. So from the early universe until galaxies started forming, we really don't know what was going on because the universe had, there were no stars. And that's important because once you have stars and galaxies, uh, then you can measure the expansion rate accurately because you can see the rate at which objects are receding from you. Uh, so I'm gonna, now I'm gonna go, I'm gonna try to capture the, uh, the screen again. So Let, let's make this the last, uh, the last question because. Okay, oh yeah, it's a little, yeah, bit, of, a little bit of housekeeping to deal with. Right, so the, uh, now you should be seeing this thing that looks like a cornucopia. Yeah. Um, let me make it a little bigger. Um, so we have the Big Bang right here, and we have an interval where it's so hot there's no atoms, but the universe is cooling. And then it gets cool enough that atoms form. And at that point, the, the light that we now see as the cosmic microwave background is frozen for all time. That'll never change. It's because we're looking at the light that existed 375,000 years after the bang. But then we have this interval of 400 million years where it's totally dark. We don't have any light posts there. And then finally, after 400 million years, stars started forming and galaxies and so forth. And you can look at stars and galaxies and measure the expansion rate. In fact, we're able to see back way back here, but we don't know anything about this interval right in here. And is there something about the, and, and when you try to calculate the expand, the current expansion rate of the universe, it would be nice to know what was going on in there. Because we can actually measure this. There might be some systematic errors, but we're, we're blind to this 400 million years of darkness. And there's nothing to look at. There's yeah. Just... So the issue is that when you do it the old-fashioned way when Hubble did it, you get something. And now if you think a little harder, you don't get the same thing. I don't quite see how that works, but I'll have to look it up. Well, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there is uh, the dichotomy is shown. Uh, Bruce, indulge me for one more minute, and then we'll, we'll move on. Yeah, no, so I think it, you knew my father, by the way, while uh, head to doing this. What did what, what your father do? Julius Hastings, uh, the uh, high flux beam reactor at Brookhaven. Oh, oh. all right. So for the, since we changed topics, here's the problem. In the last 20 years, from 2000 to 2020, uh, the technique of looking at variable stars called Cepheids has this, is this blue structure here has given us numbers for the Hubble constant that have wandered around a little bit and the measurements keep getting better and better. So the error bars keep getting smaller. And at the same time, people are using the cosmic microwave background and assumptions about expansion of the universe. And the same thing was going on. The errors were big and gradually got better and better. And we didn't know there was a problem in 2000, until 2012, roughly. Right there, you can see that the, the, the data captured by the Cepheid variables and the data captured by the CMB we can see those do not overlap. Prior to that, you couldn't tell because the error bars were so big. And then a new invention came along, this uh, red giant branch, and it didn't help because it gave us a number right between these two. But the numbers now uh, shown here, somewhere between 75 at the high end and 67 at the low end. So it's a 10% variation. And then there's this purple dot is a a piece of data that just came out in uh, November of last year. 
So it's a mystery. It's the biggest mystery in cosmology right now. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it's not worse. <laughs> yeah. You can live with this from day to day. All right, Bruce. Uh, All right. So if you can unshare again. Uh, yeah. That was, uh, as usual, you, you, can, you can take a subject about which I know nothing and I can still be entertained and, and almost get a feeling I can understand it, so. Oh, thank you. And I Great notice talk. everybody stays on, stays on just because your presentation is very good. Yes, it's, you're, you're really very good, we appreciate it. Oh yeah. Oh, so I, a couple of things. Um, next week we're gonna have uh, Corrine Foster. I don't know if, if she's on with you, John, there. Um, Neanderthals, Denisovians, and modern humans. We're going to be basically be doing um, anthropology here. And so I got to ask John Miller, is, it, is this somebody I know? Uh, yeah. 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 Do you want to do a little speech? You want to say something? No. Okay. Yeah. Well, say hi to Corinne for me. I haven't mm -hmm. seen her in a long time. And this, hey, that'll so be that, great. And then the week after that, we're going to have uh, vaccine mechanisms, MMR, and stats from Rick Schumann, who we've heard from once before. I'm sure you'll all be interested in that. And then we're going to be hearing from John Miller, the history and phenomenology of infrared. So we have a good lineup. And the, the second half of the energy talk is going to be done. And the drug talk that we didn't get today, uh, he'll, be, he'll be available in the future. And I want to remind you all that Peter Scott his, his class starts in uh, February, so you, you can still get on that, right, Peter? Uh, yep, that's right. That's that's artificial intelligence. Um, yep. Basically, they're probably going to figure out all this neutrino stuff, uh, all the loose ends. They'll just push the button on the AI, and right, <laughs> Peter. <laughs> well, <laughs> you 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 can't uh, simulate neutrinos. You have to see them. Uh, that's too bad. <laughs> okay. Well, that's uh, that's all I have. Any anything else, John? No, nothing for me. See you guys all next week. Okay. Thank you. Very hey. fun. Hey. Just add, uh, yeah. you come to this group. Thank you so much, Ed, for stepping in. This is this is fantastic. Great. Thank you, Ed. Really good talk. Thank you, Ed. I really I enjoyed it because yeah, I've done thank you. this, but it was years ago. And good. it's good to hear what's new <laughs> and what's changed. Thank you for explaining this cosmology to an organic chemist. I appreciate it. I'm glad that somebody <laughs> recommended I join. I'm a newcomer to the group. Oh, yeah. yeah. But it is really, it uh, was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I have sent you a little private message. Ed, take a look at it. Oh, I certainly will. You know, I'd love it if you would do a talk on the actual cosmic wave background, microwave background. I've always found that fascinating. And I know that they just did a new one with the Atacama telescope in right. 2020. And I'd love to just look at how that yeah. has progressed and all. It's just yeah. another thought, you know. Well, thanks a lot, Ed. And thanks a lot for stepping in. I just want to point out to the FLIR people that uh, Austin Richards uh, started his career uh, detecting neutrinos in Antarctica. Who was that? Who did you say? Austin uh, Richards. How did he do it? Uh, We've been trying to get a hold of him to, to get him to explain that. So maybe we'll get him someday. <laughs> Clear. Hey, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.